to our talk on our curtain, and we are thrilled to have Chris Hatzel here from Burlington, Vermont, where she Whoa. is <laughs> telling us the story of our, uh, the history of these different curtains that are all over New England. So, without any further, and further? All over the country. All over the country. Well, I only know about New England. And, um, <laughs> okay. So, um, I thought what I'd, I've got a slideshow that I'm going to show you other curtains by the same painter, curtains by different styles, uh, different painters, uh, all of them who worked around here. But first, I'll just point out a few things about this one. This one is probably, it's painted between 1935 and 1940. In 1940-ish, maybe one, Robert Naves, signed up and joined the Air Force during World War II. He then became a flying tiger and went off to Burma and China, where he died. He wasn't killed in a, in a battle. He was killed because his jeep went off, he drove off a mountainside. And the, I mean, let me tell you, the roads in that part of the world are still the scariest roads to ever drive on because there's never any kind of railing or anything, it's just precipice. So whenever something gets soft, you have the possibility of rolling down the mountainside. So his Jeep went off the mountain and um, he was not killed, he was hurt but not killed. They got him up somehow into an ambulance which then went off the mountain. Oh, yeah. 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 So the double whammy really it didn't, again, kill him right away, but in the hospital he died two or three days later. So that was the end of Bobby Naves at the age of 30-something, 30 35 or so. Um, but before then, he joined up with a man named Paul Brigham. And Paul Brigham was a traveling salesman. He sold <laughs> curtains, but he also sold other advertising things. Like, at that point, during the 30s and especially the 30s, the most Granges put out a booklet. And the booklet had the almanac, it had local advertising. It was a sort of booklet that would then go into insurance companies or real estate agencies, and they were given away as kind of local promotion stuff. And Granges did thing, like things like hardware stores they used to make rulers with their names on them. Oh, yeah. That's the kind of thing that, that Mr. Brigham sold, advertising items like that. And he uh, worked with several artists around New England <coughs> on theater curtains. <coughs> he met Bobby Naves and just, they became partners and he sort of adopted him as a protege. And Paul Brigham's son is still alive, lives in Framingham, Massachusetts. And it's thanks to him that I actually knew about this curtain long before I saw it because Richard Brigham has been trying to find his father's curtains for years and years and years. Now his father never painted them, never uh, you know, made them, but he sold the ads for them. So he calls them his father's curtains, curtains. And um, so, but thanks to him, thanks to Richard, um, who, had, who knew about this curtain because it was one of his father's curtains. We also have information about Naves, about how much some of these ads cost. We have some of the records, that sort of thing. And this is an advertising street scene. So there's a street. This is an entrance to a shop. There's a kind of a, I don't know, some sort of monument. There's definitely a street. And then the buildings are made up of blocks of ads. And when they couldn't sell an ad, or if they didn't have enough ads, they always sold compliments of a friend. Oh. <laughs> That's the way they basically filled a space that didn't get sold. So many of their curtains have got compliments of a friend somewhere, and there wasn't any friend. They just filled it in because you don't want to have a blank space. And I'm going to show you a picture of Richard still has the original template that they used to fill in to sell the cur to sell the ads for the curtains. And he let me copy it. So I have copies of this thing that they would scribble on. 
and they would write in the name or write on the back, you know, the contents of what each ad would say. And then Naves would go back to Exeter, which is where he lived, Exeter, New Hampshire, stretch out the canvas on his barn wall. You can still see the little dots on the side. That's from stretching, pinning the, the, the fabric to the wall. And once made, um, they'd come back with the roller materials, with boards, and make it on the spot, put it up. It was a homegrown kind of industry, at least for these people. These people were, you know, solo artists. There was not a studio, really. It was a barn. Naves usually did curtains in pairs. So at this kind of hall, there would have been a front curtain as well. It probably had a sort of elementary drapery on it and a scene, and probably a local scene, your mountains, your lake, whatever was locally identifiable. Because he wasn't much of one for putting castles and, and romantic images. He tended to paint local stuff. And I, again, have pictures of some of them. And also in my book here, I have other pictures of Nave's pairs of curtains. So what I'm going to do, um, oh, and the other feature, he always has a blimp. You know, blimps were hugely popular in the 30s. And um, until the great disasters, they were just the marvel of the age. Everybody was fascinated by blimps. So Naves almost always has a nice fat blimp sitting up in the sky. Other artists had long skinny blimps. I mean, there were blimps, usually in these street scene advertisements. So this one uh, was night was really dirty. There was hardly torn at all. There's two little tiny holes, but it was filthy and it had gotten wet. You can see up there. That's from water damage. And we have cleaned it. And tomorrow we'll get to trying to do to reduce the damage from the water. It won't be perfect because we're not restoring the curtain. We're not pretending it's brand new but it won't bother you. You'll be able to sit here, and the first thing you will not look at is the damage, mm -hmm. you know? Right now, your eye kind of goes to the damage, and, and that's normal. So this is an interim display. We're going to, eventually, it will be hanging roughly where it is now, but lights are going to be moved, and you know we're, we haven't finished putting the ropes on. We just wanted to get it up so you could see it tonight. And we're going to take it down tomorrow and work on it on the tables. It's much easier to work on it down than to go on ladders and try to paint up close when what you really want to do is step back and be able to see what you're doing. But we don't want to fall off the stage. So about 20 years ago, I was the director of the Statewide Museum Association in Vermont. It was called Vermont Museum and Gallery Alliance. And anybody who collected anything belonged to the Alliance. So our job is to provide help for collections, costumes, books, stuffed animals. It didn't matter what it was, if it was a collection in a historical society or a museum, we would help people with storage, with presentation, with documenting, all those things that you have to do if you have stuff. There are, just like you are in this building, there are historical societies in town halls in Vermont where the upstairs has been let go because of ADA and the historical society has been given access to the upstairs. And it's the upstairs where there is a stage and on the stage, at least many times, there's curtains. And they were torn and they were dirty. Sometimes they were just lying on the floor Sometimes they were under the stage. Sometimes they were okay, but just ratty looking. So the, our mem several of our members asked us, what do we do about these great big, dirty, torn pieces of fabric? And we didn't know. Nobody knew because nobody had ever paid any attention to them. But we, I decided to write a couple grants, and I got money from the National Trust for Historic Pres Preservation, and then the National Endowment for the Arts, to try to figure out how to conserve these painted theater curtains, and even to find out what they were. We didn't know what they were made of. We didn't know what the paint was. We, we, nobody could tell us anything. 
But I had a little group of conservators who were willing to try anything and willing to, to learn. So we started out um, with 12 curtains and just figured out the basics, even how to get them down, how to make an island of tables, like your island of tables here, how to handle them, how to turn them over, how to make a roller, how to, what to do. And it, it was a lot of trial and error. And, um, and, you know, and we kept running into things we'd never seen before, including what do we do about a curtain that's 45 feet wide and 25 feet high? What do we do? How, how on earth do you handle something like that? Um, anyway, <coughs> over time, we got better at it. And also over time, as we worked on the first dozen or so, People uh, in other towns started calling and saying, okay, we've got a curtain. We'd like to get in line for you to come and help us. And I had grant money that allowed me to do that. So each town paid a little bit, but usually for one curtain, it was 500 bucks. Two curtains, to two to three, be 750, maybe 1,000. And I think only in one place that had 10 curtains did we charge $3,000? Because it took us weeks to do 10 curtains. But, so it was very affordable. And, and all the towns wanted to do this. And then I found out about Grange Halls. I'd never heard of Grange Halls. But it uh, turned out that Grange Halls had curtains too. And um, so we included the Granges. We just basically felt that anybody who had a curtain we wanted to help, whether it was privately owned, like a Grange, or publicly owned, like a town. We don't care. It's the curtain that needs help. So, long story short, we did 191 curtains in Vermont. And there is only one more to do, and we're going to do it next year. And as we wrapped that up, people started calling from other states. And so, we as a little group of conservators and me made a new nonprofit called Curtains Without Borders because we wanted to work in New Hampshire and Maine and Massachusetts, anywhere else. And we've been doing that ever since. And um, along the way, we've met relatives of, the, of many of the artists. We've learned uh, not only how to do the conservation, but how to recognize, when I saw the first foot of this curtain, I knew who painted it, I just knew because we've worked on enough curtains by the same artists. And, um, and we, we do, every curtain is different. We always have new challenges, but each one is interesting. So we're still doing it 21 years later. Okay, now that's a mess. <laughs> there is a true mess. I mean, really, these rips are, you know, there's whole sections missing big long rips and water stains all over the place. So this is actually the upper corner of a curtain. These are some of the patches on the back side. We make patches out of muslin. The curtains are made of muslin. And we go Joanne Fabrics, unpainted, you know, unbleached muslin. We use the same material to patch as the curtains are made of. And we use a film called Beva that melts the fabric on as a patch, but it's reversible. With a lot more heat, it'll peel off. Whereas if you use, if you've ever used like a patch from Walmart or somewhere, like a pat, iron on patch, if you try to ever get it off, it will rip the fabric underneath <laughs> rather than release it because it's stronger. The glue is so strong that it will, it would rather rip the fabric than let go. So we make patches that are reversible. That's just, that was the back side, and there's the curtain. Ooh. Wow. And here is the area we created. Wow. We mended it, here's, this, here's an old, here's a men. Mm -hmm. And we painted in approximately hmm. what was missing. But here, we don't try to paint in everything. Mm -hmm. the, this is 120 years old, this curtain. Wow. So we're not trying to pretend that it's brand new, but we made it so it was usable for another lifetime, for another generation. That's what we try to do. Now here is another example. 
terrible water stains. And because a curtain is kept rolled up, if it gets wet on top, the water goes down in rows. And usually when a curtain is wet, it's because the roof has leaked and the tar in the water is nasty stuff and it creates tide lines. Mm -hmm. So there are three rows there and there's six inches of duct tape at the bottom holding the whole thing together. And in fact, every seam along the back was also covered with duct tape. Oh, no. So that was an interesting challenge. And there it is today. Oh, and look, you can see the stain, mm -hmm. but it doesn't bother you. So that's, that's the kind of conservation that we do. And all the material was there to work with. Getting off that sticky duct tape was not pleasant because the residue didn't want to come off. We had to use, I think, acetone and carefully scraping it all off. But there it is. Now this kind of damage is where, this is a curtain that's halfway up in the air because it actually was a fly curtain. A very, the opera houses and very large stages have curtains that go straight up instead of rolling. They go up on side on frames and then the frame, then there are heavy, oh, counterweights and the whole thing goes straight up. Well, this thing was stuck and this hole they, people had put on backing, trying to keep it all together, but this is a huge hole. When we finally forced it down, I was able to actually bend over and go through that hole. And there's that curtain oh, today. There because the material was actually all there. It was a oh. huge three-corner tear, and there wasn't, the material was still there. So we cleaned it up. It was right up through here. It was a big tear and uh, got it back up on stage. <coughs> if you want to go up, look closely at it, you'll see the line where we mended, but it's disguised well enough, so you don't care. Now here's our guy. Naves is, uh, as I say, he was a young guy even when he was killed. His first cousin still lives in St. Johnsbury, and another one also lives in Springfield, Vermont. And they had photographs and letters and things from their cousin. So that's how we got to find out about who he was. And here is a typical Bobby Knaves front curtain. Now it's, they have taken down their stage entirely and only left a platform. So both curtains hang without the framework of an arch. This is you know, your proscenium arch here. And they at some point just did away with the whole business. But that's the actual scene in Brookfield of the floating bridge. It's their sort of landmark. And then behind it hangs their street scene. Now, this one's a little different. You see here, it's all bricks. Yours is left plain, but it's the same design. Here's this odd monument thingy thingy. It's the same one. And here, and there's the blimp. It's shaped exactly like your blimp. In fact, it's the same blimp. Yeah. Here they put two billboards in the middle of the street instead of the truck. So they sold the ice cream and somebody else. But, I mean, it's so close to yours, it's slightly different, but, you know, basically the same idea. That's because this is the template they used. And I've got one that's got, these are all dimensions, 12 inch by 24 inch. These are the size of the ads. You see? And truck in street. That was generally what they were aiming for, was to have some company with a truck and put it in the street and charge them more. And here's the, in this case, there are only two ads on the side. You've got four. But it's the same idea. In this case, it really does look like that's a flap for a uh, garbage, a trash barrel. Mm -hmm. I swear. Doesn't it look like a trash barrel? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what he thought he was doing. But that's what they worked from. And it says Crystal Arts Studio, which is what they call themselves. And I think uh, the, the, the ad is, um, I mean, the address is for Brigham. And then it says Robert uh, Naves, something, something, artist. And here is an example of the book that Richard Brigham still has. He's got a half a dozen or more 
where these ads, where they were sold. You know, your $10 ads, somebody had already paid, they paid $7.50, you know, here he's paid $15 out of the whatever he owes. It's an old fashioned ledger and we actually have this, we don't, Enfield has this curtain um, rolled up in storage at the moment, but here's the original book showing uh, how they would go out and sell ads. And I think um, Adelia was saying that the Grange would have made money, but no. What the great, what, what Knaves and Brigham would do, and all the other people, they would come to the Grange or the town hall and say, we'll make you a pair of curtains. You give us the names of people to go to, to sell ads to. I don't think that the Grange made any money from it, but they got curtains for free. Because then Brigham would go visit this list of people until he got approximately $175. Somewhere between $175 and $200 max. And that would pay Knaves and himself for two curtains that they would install and deliver and so forth so that that's what the institution got out of the deal. They didn't make money on it, as far as we know. Now here is another Knaves curtain, and this is three feet long by about two feet high, just missing. Probably caught on a nail when they tore it down and took it off the, the boards it was on. And there's that curtain today. And here's that section. See, we made a new section. And we didn't know what the lettering was. We don't know what it said, so we left it blank. But you don't care. It doesn't offend you. And, uh, and here's truck in street. You know, yeah. same thing. <laughs> this one's St. Johnsbury trucking. Slightly bigger, slightly different. No trash can, but, yeah, but very similar. This one is another Naves in Newton, New Hampshire. And we have the book for this one, or we, Richard has the book. So we know how much each of these people paid for their ad. There's truck and street, that's what we were pointing to. And we think later on, somebody else painted the lions upon top. The, lo the local high school team are called the lions, but I don't think Knaves painted those lions. I think some art teacher came along and added the lions. This again is a typical Knaves front scene. Not exactly fancy, but it eh, works. It's, a, it's Lake Willoughby inside a picture frame with a bit of drapery pulled aside. And that's the sort of thing that you would have had at the front of your stage, too. And again, in Glover, here's the truck actually as an ad, but they've got filling station in the, in the street. It's the same idea, same blimp, only they've divided it between two ads. You know, there are more ads sold on this one, but look, they didn't. There's that one empty, that one's empty, and that one's empty. So they didn't finish selling all the ads, but it was all they had. And then this one is simpler. This one we just finished up um, a year or so ago. And this one is more, much more primitive, as is the whole thing. The whole thing, look at the lettering, is all very standard. It's, it's, it's just much more primitive, and I think it was one of his first efforts that, um, you know, they still had this barrel, this thing, but there's no elegance anywhere. Well, there's some nice lettering, but it's a very plain Jane, and I just think it's an early one of his. Now, this one is down in Pelham, Old Town Hall. It's a Knaves curtain, but somebody has come in and added highlights and all kinds of sort of decorative paint job and painted right on top of it. And the reason we know it's his is because on the back side, there are ads. They, they took the curtain, painted on the back side of the curtain and made a, another scene. People do the oddest things. Now, some of the other painters who are roaming around at exactly the same time, there were three women scenic artists, and the only three women that I found in the entire country. And they all were working at the same time, 
in central New Hampshire and Vermont and Maine and probably New uh, Massachusetts, but we haven't found their curtains yet. But they all, Brigham worked with them. They all knew each other. This is Marion Fraser. And this is one of her advertising curtains. And she really goes in for velvet looking drapes and fancy flowers that are kind of holding them. That's a local scene, Lake Willoughby. And then most of hers have got this balcony. It's her like feature. She doesn't do blimps. She does it this way. So this is how she constructs her advertising curtains. And then Lucretia, who was again somebody she knew, her daughter's still alive down on the Cape. She painted the Burlington curtain, which I found at an auction. And there is no statue anywhere in Vermont that looks like that. That is a made up vision of a statue. There are no tall buildings, certainly not in Burlington, no skyscrapers. So again, a very different interpretation of a street advertising scene. Not like Naves, not like Marion. This is a different artist, but doing the same idea. But then she also did this wonderful one where the musicians are here and all the ads are in balloons. Just, just a wonderful, happy curtain. Isn't that wonderful? Yes, it is. I love it. Huh. Another person, again, working at the same time, overlapping territory, Arthur Ives is pictured there, and he did more elegant. Everything he touched is more elegant than the others. The little decorative things, the naked cherubs that are pulling away the curtain so that you get a chance to see the picture in the gold picture frame, which is just a pair of bridges. I mean, it's like nothing in the middle. And here's his advertising, one of his. Now his blimp is basically a milk bottle. I mean, it's, it's like, and it's got a propeller. It's got a lot more detail, but it's essentially the same idea of a street where you have, you know, two columns of ads and something sitting in the street, not right in the middle in this case. So there were a lot of people in this business at the time. And, uh, they, and they all traveled around, tried to get the business from the towns and the granges for these curtains. They were, they, I, as far as I know, they weren't cutthroat, but they certainly had territory that overlapped. This is another Ives curtain where the painting is really superior. That's the Winooski River. And it was done for Northfield and there's Norwich University there. Now, another company was Wood Brothers and they were out of Springfield, Mass. And they were big. They were bigger than all these other people put together. They had reps who would go out with booklets showing what they could do. This one is an odd, this is Wood Brothers, but it doesn't look like any other Wood Brothers. All this is painted. This is all green painted fabric. And again, they still didn't sell all their ads, but it hangs in the town hall in Eastham, right behind the offices of the town clerk. It's a big curtain. And it's uh, very pretty. It's just that it's a different style. This is more typical, but it's not absolutely typical of Wood Brothers. This curtain has not been worked on. It's at the Greenfield Grange. I've seen it, but they don't have any interest in restoring it or installing it. I hope they will someday. We've wrapped it up and put it away. You can see at the bottom, it's got nice duct tape holding the curtain onto the rail, onto the bottom roller, which is fine. It will peel off. Local ads, again, not sold, and a picture in the middle that's just nothing. I mean, not nothing. It's just generic, a wheat field. So if you know anybody at the Greenfield Grange, you should poke them and say, hey, where's your curtain? Now, here's another one that's in storage. It's actually at the museum in Taunton. It's from a Taunton Grange, and it's Wood Brothers. They love to use bright yellow, gold-colored fabric on their, on their drapes, their bottom, 
And again, just a lake with a couple houses, nothing local or identifiable, but very competent and, and also very blue. The undercoat of their, un, the base coat on top of which they did all their painting is always blue, always pale blue. And this again is Wood Brothers. I mean, I defy you to, tell, you know, to have that be a particular place. It's just a, a pond. But again, it's got that blue wash underneath the, the ads. And they did, a lot of, they did a lot of curtains all over the place. And through the same time period, 1920s, 1930s, into the early 40s, but by the time World War II comes, really comes along, the whole thing, the whole craft was disappearing because of the movies. People were building movie houses instead of investing in their <coughs> stages. It was much more exciting to build a movie house. And then there's another local person in northern Massachusetts named Thurston Munson. And he did advertising curtains, including a blimp, nice little blimp up there. Uh, he's very sort of angular. There's not a soft line anywhere. No drapes. He just filled it with ads. And so that's in Leverett Town Hall. We haven't worked on that one. It could, it's fine, but you see the line of dirt. It'd be nice to just give it a little cleanup someday. But it's basically in great shape. But then here's another one by Thurston um, that we finished, oh, I don't know, last month, two months ago. So this one is their local river up in Leiden. And it's a very pretty curtain, done mid-1930s. Same time frame. Here's one he did in Wendell, which is very strange. So this is normal. These are all very pale gray. I mean, there are ads up and down, but you can barely read them. And my first thought, or my, my considered thought, was that it was a kind of a pre-paint. Like he had sketched them in, and then was gonna come along with color and, and finish off the ads. But there was a woman who actually knew him, knew Thurston, and watched him paint this. And his idea was, he was trying to copy Japanese rice paper. He was trying to make the ads look like rice paper, thin, I don't know what he was thinking. He was very elderly when he did this one. He was 90 something and he died the next year. But it's very strange, you can read them, but barely. Now another sort of regional company that, that was all over in this area and everywhere else is Hubert Scenic Company from Buffalo and also Anderson, the, the two companies that look very similar. Their side drapes always look like that. And there's red and yellow. It was like they painted them first and then filled in the scene after. And there's always a green area down below. So again, the telltale thing is the style of the drape. Oh, and the fact that it's signed. I mean, that helps too. Now down in Northampton, I don't know if any of you have been down there to see this. this this thing. This was 45 feet wide and 23 feet tall. It took 60 tables to work on this. And I had to set them up with aisles between the tables. I have two groups of two and two and two and aisles in between because it was so heavy we couldn't roll it just by working on holding it on the ends and we couldn't get to the middle of it, so we made aisles between the tables just big enough to walk so somebody could help roll this thing. They found it just hanging behind their velvet grand drape, and they didn't know that they had it. They thought it was just a liner. And then somebody said, oh my gosh, it's painted on the front. So they separated the two pieces and found this. It was so dirty that you could not see what was on it at all. And then, and it, it's still hard to see, but here's a lake. This is the lake in, in Northampton. And this here is the structure that actually was a factory in town. That was a tower from a factory. And it looked so romantic, they, this guy put it in the curtain. And then there are all these laurel wreaths and so forth. 
This is 1912, I believe. It, it's kept, it flies. It goes all the way up into the dark ceiling depths up there. And they will only rarely bring it down. But it is the biggest thing that we've ever seen, and we'll never, never do a big one like that again. <laughs> it almost killed us. This one almost killed us in a different way. This is orange, a very pretty curtain that was in very scratched up, seriously scratched up condition. And it um, now is back on stage and it's been in painted. It looks a lot better than this. This is mid, mid work. And I don't have a final picture, but I'm going back to give a talk there in November and then I'm gonna get the lighting set up and I'll take good pictures of it. It's a very beautiful curtain, and it now hangs at the back instead of hanging at the front <coughs> because uh, they put in drapes and lights and all kinds of stuff. But it's really, it's a, it's a statue of um, the Concord Minuteman. Yeah. And underneath it says, the Concord Minuteman sponsored by Minute Tapioca. <laughs> <laughs> because Minute Tapioca was in orange until quite recently, and it was the biggest employer, and they paid for the curtain. Wow. It turns out they have a fire yeah. curtain that is up high, straight up, right at the front, that they've never seen. But somebody came along with a photograph of it, and it's got painted tapioca fields, which are trees, mm -hmm. with sort of palm trees in the middle. <laughs> it's the whole thing is painted with drapery and stuff. So again, my my asbestos buddy has been called and he's going to try to come and they're going to try to clean it and save it. But it's, but it's been so, it's been hidden for so long that nobody could remember seeing it. I, over in Templeton, which is not very far from you guys, this is as, just as pretty as can be. Yes. It's in storage right now, it hasn't been worked on yet. Somebody named W.A. Tandy, never heard of him, don't know who he was. Whoever it was, did a very, very pretty curtain with dark blue drapes and gold detail. And in back of it is an advertising curtain, some nice big holes, but they're mendable, by that Marion Fraser, one of those other uh, people I showed you. And I forget where, but she signed it, so that's how we know. Again, a very different style of a street advertising curtain. Now this one in North Yarmouth, Maine, there's that nice dirt line we got rid of. A long skinny blimp, whole different, different style, different person. And we now know it was somebody from upstate New York, even though it was in North Yarmouth, Maine. But the sad thing is that uh, they did some renovations oh, okay. and the workmen went home for the weekend. Fire started and the big propane tank out back burst. And you know, that was it. All gone, oh every last gosh. bit of it. So fire really is the enemy of curtains. That and, that's the end of this, um, the dump. You know, people giving up and just dumping them. Mm. And of course, leaking roofs. Leaking roofs don't help um, because the, when they get wet, the paint just turns into nothing. It just goes away into nasty tide lines. And uh, I don't know if I can get that to go up again. But uh, so the so the curtains are the curtains are remarkably sturdy, but they need loving care. I mean, they are even Naves's curtains are now eighty years old. You know, they're they're not they're no longer there. We go. I'm just gonna make it go bye bye. And it's going to magically continue up. What um, the paint is all water-based paints. That's why water, when it gets on the curtain, takes the paint and turns it through these tide lines. Now, there are very few curtains that are um, acrylic or house paint. Like Thurston Munson used a kind of a, a early version of house paint, <coughs> acrylic paints. Um, and they can, that can get wet, it won't hurt it. But most, the, the, most of the artists, they mix powder and water and animal high glue in pots. And the animal high glue had to be melted, and then each color 
was made and discarded at the end of the day because you can't keep that glue. It turns to jelly and, and mush and, and doesn't work, which is why in general they work really fast. They work probably, you know, more than a day, but the lettering, I mean, one, one thing you can see if you look up close is there are all kinds of pencil lines that he drew on to show him where the letters would go. And a lot of the letters have got a thin pencil. You can see the pencil underdrawing as he laid out so that he wouldn't get to the end of the line and not have, not have um, you know, room for uh, the last couple letters. You know how it is when you make a handmade sign and all of a sudden you've got three letters with no room in them. So, um, the, uh, so there are a lot of pencil lines that, that he would use, probably sketched up. And then the actual painting, I'll bet he went lickety split because of, the, because of that glue, nasty, uh, the way you have to make the paints. Maybe even one day, I don't know. He'd make up, make up his colors and off he'd go. Uh, having done all the prep, you know, like the sketching out of where everything went in the letters and so forth. Um, I actually, we, we just don't know. There, none of these people are alive to tell us. And uh, they didn't consider it worth writing down, so we don't know. One thing, you don't, one thing I didn't show you Many, many curtains came from very large studios all across the country, Chicago, New York, Boston. These were, these were mass producing studios and they had paint frames which were big wooden structures where they would tack the muslin up on and then they would disappear into the floor in slots like an old cow barn. And so the painter could stand on one, one level and they just lower the curtain up and down so he could paint the different parts of it. Otherwise, they're up on ladders trying to paint. So a paint frame would have a slot on the floor, and the whole thing would, with ropes would go up and down. Mm. And they churned out many, many hundreds of curtains, these places, and especially for the larger halls. So a larger hall, and, and sometimes small town halls too, would have a, a set of curtains, and the set was usually five. A grand drape at the front, a street scene, not an advertising street scene, but a street like that first one of Henry, a formal parlor interior for your Victorian love story. All you put in is a little settee and you've got your formal, you know, painted wallpaper, decorative things on the walls. <coughs> A rustic interior for Uncle Tom's cabin, uh, any kind of uh, upstairs, downstairs type of, you know, the simple country life kind of thing. You couldn't put them in a parlor. So you had a rustic interior which would have maybe a painted stove off in one corner, you know, a little pot belly stove, and it might have painted um, shelves with uh, cracked dishes on it. You know, something, uh, the poor man's kind of interior, and then at the way back would be a country scene, all purpose, hills, woodland, anything outdoors. So you could do your indoors and you could do your outdoors. And almost all plays could be accommodated that way uh, on skits and things. And occasionally they would add a seascape. If you needed, if, you, if there was some, you know, if they wanted to do something where there was a ship at sea or a story about, you know, an ocean side or an ocean thing, then they would add an ocean, usually with a lighthouse somewhere, and usually with a ship somewhere out at sea. And that was kind of a standard package that people would order. Thank you. So thank much. you all for coming. Oh, thank you. Thank you.